right, so um, Simona, go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, I choose verse number three, and I will read it in two different versions in English, the, the one we have and the other one from the book of Ken McLeod with a few words, the first words of, the, of his comment. By avoiding bad objects, disturbing emotions gradually decrease. Without distractions, virtuous activities naturally increase. With clarity of mind, conviction in the teaching arises. Cultivate seclusion. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. In another translation. Don't engage disturbances and emotional reactions gradually fade away. Don't engage distractions and spiritual practice naturally grows. Keep awareness clear and vivid and confidence in the way arises. Rely on silence. This is the practice of a bodhisattva. And then he adds, how many wars do you go to every day? Every disturbance, every emotional reaction projects a different word. Like a flea on a hot stove, you jump from one war to another. Never mind jet lag. You are a different person in each ward. Alice had an easier time in Wonderland. How do you find your path? In silence. How do you practice silence? You listen. Thank you, Simona, that one is beautiful. Um, for those of you that like that translation, that's what Reflections on Silver River, is that where that's coming from? Yeah, it's a beautiful commentary on 37 Practices, Reflections on Silver River. Um, in our Joyous Efforts section, there's like a couple pages from there in there. So if you wanna have a look at that style, if you, if you like that style, it's beautiful. And um, there's a, a commentary that I use a lot for 37 practices, also called um, Heart of Compassion by uh, Dilgo Kinsey Rinpoche. And it's, it's more um, technical, but it's still very heart-centered. So um, anyway, it's uh, one of the reasons I chose 37 practices as one of our, you know, bodhicitta revivers is that there are so many commentaries on it. So if you liked it and you were sort of finding that this text was really intriguing, there's a lot you could do with it. It's not like this is the end of the conversation once we're done with this semester. You can keep going over the same um, verses if you like them and find lots and lots of other commentaries um, to go deeper and deeper into them. It would be a beautiful text to do a retreat on, even one verse. <laughs> so um, anyway couple extra recommended readings, Reflections on Silver River and uh, the Heart of Compassion. All right, so today we're going to look at um, verses 27 and 28, which are on page five. And so um, verses 27 and uh, verses 28 are still related to the perfections. And these two are um, first perfection of patience, then perfection of joyous effort, which we've already talked about a lot in depth. 
So um, the patience one, to bodhisattvas who want a wealth of virtue, those who harm are like a precious treasure. Therefore, toward all cultivate fortitude without hostility. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So you guys did a lot on patience last semester and you did a, um, a retreat on patience. That, is that right? Yeah. Do you remember kind of key themes um, that really resonated with you or that you found that you're able to pull into your life? Just a couple ways of thinking that you keep coming back to or something that shifted for you as, as the result of thinking more about the perfection of patience? Just kind of sitting with, you know, going back into your memories of last semester. What do you remember as kind of intriguing points? Yeah. I think I think uh, I feel that uh, patience is very related. Um, first of all, um, to uh, to uh, uh, impermanence, and uh, for us a lot with empathy, uh, with all the, it's with all that uh, it holds. Yeah, it holds. That's a that's a nice framing. It does, with some steadiness and consistency. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Sigalit, did you have something? Yeah, you read my mind. You read my mind. Something about the connection uh, between uh, the opposite, the, uh, about patient and anger. So. I found it very useful and every time uh, that I feel anger, it's not a lot of time, but, but when it happens, I know that there is a failure in the in, in patient. It helps me. Yeah. Um, it's said on the Bodhisattva path um, that patience is kind of your main like walking stick or your main security post or the thing that sees you through. And, you know, I think that patience is something that's talked about a lot in ordinary terms and we're really familiar with the concept. I remember asking um, the little kids in the family day that I used to host once a month, I asked them, what is patience? And one of the kids who was like six years old, she said, it means waiting. I thought it was very cute. It means waiting. <laughs> Obviously, her mother had <laughs> told her to practice patience a lot. But I thought there was something kind of profound in that. It means waiting. It means waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting for the suffering of this moment to pass. Very similar to what Iran was saying of with an acknowledgement of impermanence, you can hold still. You know, you know that this moment of suffering is going to change. And because you remember it's going to change, you can wait, no problem. And um, it, it is interesting to kind of sit with it as that concept of what allows us to relax into waiting. You know, to kind of go, all right, that bus is late. You know, as opposed to, oh my gosh, the bus is late, you know, what, what is the shift that happens in the mind that allows waiting to be a place of peace, rather than a place of anxiety and pressure. And, and so, you know, the divisions and divisions and divisions of things can be a little bit um, exhausting, but I think that it is useful to divide it into what do you look at when you're waiting, or what are you patient with? And in this section, it's so immediate to our experience. You're patient with people, you're patient with suffering, or you're patient with the spiritual path. You know, those are the three, three, three things we have to be patient with, isn't it? We're patient with other people. They either take what we want or don't give us what they want, what we want, right? 
whether that's valid or invalid, whether it's accurate or inaccurate, we lose our patience when people don't do what we want. And it sounds so basic to frame things that way. You know, it sounds so coarse and, um, you know, superficial, like, no, 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 that's not why I lose my patience. I lose my patience because I think they're better than this. Or I think that they're the blah, 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 you know, and we give ourselves sophisticated reasoning. But at the essence of losing our patience is you didn't behave the way I think you should behave, the way I want you to behave. Even if the way I want you to behave is healthy and of benefit to all, still there's a, a pressure and an expectation that when it's not met, then the reaction is impatience, anger, etc. So tracing back the root of attachment underneath anger is very helpful for cultivating patience. You know, so if you're, you know, you're feeling impatient, you're feeling lack of patience, there's some irritation and anger there to go back a step and ask, not what am I angry at, but what expectation did I have that wasn't being met? What attachment got thwarted? Yeah. Um, my teacher always says in English at this point, uh, when attachment going, then anger coming, isn't it? <laughs> in this sort of Yoda English, right? Attachment going, then anger coming. Yeah. So if there were no attachment, would there be anger? It, you know, if there were no expectations, would there be no, dis there would be no disappointment. And the, the discussion of is depression repressed anger or not kind of comes in because what is depression exactly, sadness exactly? It doesn't look like anger or sound like anger and it's more maybe quiet than anger and yet is it maybe just the same thing? And that's kind of a basic, you know, psychology concept I'm sure you talk about a lot. But what is, what is the role of sadness in impatience? Yeah, because sometimes sadness, depression of a certain type, not all types, but of a certain type, there's a real, um, I didn't get what I wanted. I didn't get what I wanted and therefore I'm collapsing into a heap. Yeah, I'm collapsing in or I'm raging out, but it's basically the same energy. Do you, do you think so? Or is, that, is it too basic, too simplistic? I don't know. But there, is there a relationship between sadness and anger? and losing your patience in both cases. It's something worth sitting with because we'll give ourselves permission more easily in some cultures for sadness, ennui, melancholy, and in some cultures we give ourselves more permission for rage, impatience, volatility, you know, and it depends where you go, what expression of discontent is allowed. But it's an expression of discontent. You know, when I was in Sweden, for example, it was just like a sea of like sad grumpies sad grumpies but they were so polite and they were so quiet and sweet that you could just tell there was like volcano underneath but they you know weren't allowed to express it in the way that um maybe you wouldn't see that, that you would see in like spain for example and in spain the volcanoes were just out and spilling and out and spilling you know and they would not have classed themselves as sad but when someone is angry they look sad <laughs> you know under and under and under so this is all very basic, but when we're asking ourselves what makes us deflated, you know, kind of takes the, what takes the wind out, what makes us lose our patience? Because right now in this situation, we have to practice a lot of patience with unknowing. You know, how long is this going to last? What form is it going to take? What's it going to be like afterwards? And to be able to wait without anxiety, to wait with relaxation. It's such a simple practice, and yet how hard is it? You know, a couple days, no problem. A couple weeks, okay. A couple months, oh. You know, like how long does it take before the cracks start to show in our practice of patience, and what conditions make those cracks? It's interesting to investigate. So, so if we're looking at patience with people, 
that is the work that we have been doing our whole life. How do we be patient with people, you know, doing what is unexpected or what we don't want? It's a long conversation. Patience with suffering is the other one, which still relies on a knowledge of impermanence. Yeah, so you're sitting there, you're having physical suffering of, I don't know, heat, or physical suffering of um, empty stomach, full stomach, whatever is happening with your stomach, you know, suffering of headache, suffering of whatever, and it is easier when you remember it will end, and it is harder when you forget that it's going to end. Simple as that. The, the worst pain is thinking this is forever. You can sort of bear anything if you think it's time limited. You know, we even do things voluntarily that are painful because we know they're time limited and we like what they lead to. I mean, how, you know, most, most women wind up getting their ears pierced at some point. It hurts to get your ears pierced, but we're like, yeah, but then I can wear earrings and earrings are pretty. So I'll put up with a big metal rod being stuck through my earlobe and, and say, ow, all right, anyway, beauty is coming, you know? Um, it's fascinating. So if we know it's temporary and we like what it leads to, we'll put up with a lot. I think the other piece of impatience is not thinking that it's going anywhere or leading to anything, which kind of feeds into the last form of patience, which is subtler, which is patience with the spiritual path or patience with Dharma. In the Lam Rim, it's called certitude of the Dharma. And it's this patience that's developed by being so convinced that practicing the Dharma is worthwhile, works, useful, that when you don't see immediate change, you're still able to be patient because you know that practice leads to perfection, even if in this moment you don't seem to be making any progress. So, so just kind of looking at, you know, we'll put up with a lot if we have conviction that it's leading to something worthwhile. If we don't have conviction that it's leading to something worthwhile, immediately patient impatience starts to bubble up and we get anxiety and agitation and that frustrated feeling. And so can everything lead to something useful? Of course it can, just like in the verse, um, bodhisattvas who want a wealth of virtue, those who harm are like a precious treasure. So the idea of putting up with a difficult person changes completely into how wonderful I have this precious person in front of me to help me practice. Because without them, I would be complacent. Without them, there would be less stimulus, less impetus to change. But when you're confronted with someone that is not your preference, your lack of compassion shows itself, your holes in your patience show itself, and that is vital information for our path. So they really are a precious treasure. You don't have to pretend and make some sort of mental dance of reframing. They genuinely are a precious treasure because without them, there is less progress. They're the very thing we needed. So these are familiar concepts that we've talked about a lot. And there is a very simple kind of superficial level of it, which is easy to understand. But in terms of our own everyday irritability and annoyance, or our own everyday kind of melancholy, uh, you know, shades of sadness, whichever version of it we fall into, to ask what was the expectation at the core and was it reasonable is still important, even though intellectually we know better. You know, what was the expectation that wasn't getting met? Was it reasonable? Probably not, because most expectations are built on an assumption of permanence. Yeah, most expectations are built on an assumption of permanence. Do you agree that there's some sort of stability more possible than is really the case? Some sort of certainty that's more possible than is really the case? If we had no grasping at permanence, would we ever be impatient? If we always lived in flow, or if we always lived in awareness of change, would we be more relaxed?
Maybe, I don't know. Words like always and never are tricky, but I think to say probably, mostly, <laughs> probably mostly. So, you know, so then, you know, you sit here and I was thinking yesterday, you know, it was so hot and it wasn't cooling down and I don't like to have the air conditioning on all day because it's taking lots of power and it's noisy and, you know, like everybody, right? Um, and I thought, okay, I'd like to sleep with the windows open and the cool night air blowing in because in normal countries at nighttime it gets colder. <laughs> here <laughs> at nighttime it is not getting colder so i had an expectation that nighttime equals windows open fresh night air it'll be lovely i'll have a nice sleep not so <laughs> and it's not like i've never been to israel at this time you know i've been here quite a few years now and i know i know better but my expectation was when it cools down i will give myself permission to relax like, why couldn't I give myself permission to relax in the heat? In the wintertime in Montana, I voluntarily go to a sauna. You know, saunas are very, very hot. They're hotter than this. And I go into them voluntarily and totally relax. You know, when I was in Finland, it was like a sauna extravaganza. Everyone had one in their house as if it was a shower and a totally normal thing to have in their home. So, you know, so I was, I was remembering all the times that it was cold in Montana and sitting in the hot, hot sauna and then encouraging humidity by pouring water onto the hot coals on purpose, right? And then like all the times of going to um, Indian sweat lodges, you know, because I'm an old hippie, right? So going to Indian sweat lodges and it is hot in a sweat lodge. The whole point is to sweat and it's the most blissful, relaxing thing. It's beautiful. So I was laughing at myself thinking, what, you give yourself permission to relax when it cools down. You used to give yourself permission to relax when it got hot. And just those little like reframings, still it was hot and it was hard to sleep, but my mind was not so agitated about it. It's, so it's not like anything fundamentally changed about the outside. A small tiny shift happened in the inside, enough to relieve the pressure I'd put on myself. You know, the way in which I'd robbed myself of a level of peace that was immediately accessible. So we have these levels of peace and contentment and happiness that are long-term projects that we're working up to. But we also have immediate peace and happiness that we deprive ourselves of just because of our weird ways of thinking. So, you know, practicing patience is twofold. What is the immediate release of pressure what is the long-term cultivation of mental training? So, you know, it's just kind of sitting with right now, in this moment when there is anxiety, what is the, what is the core of impatience under anxiety? Sometimes there's attachment under anxiety, sometimes there's anger under anxiety, but we kind of give ourselves this idea that anxiety is a normal and acceptable mental state to have in this world at this time because of how crazy busy we are, how much pressure there is on us, et cetera, et cetera. It's like a socially acceptable mental illness, anxiety. Yeah, and we all have versions of it at different times. What is, what is underneath it? Because it's like there is a lack of patience there. And the whole discussion of patience is to basically give you your power back to give you your power back that you actually don't have to run around in circles, mentally, physically, you don't have to run around and make projects and make busyness and make outcomes. You could just wait and see the way things play out. And in that space of waiting is more opportunity for creativity anyway. And in that space is more possibility for connection. So, you know, this is an old conversation. Um, add to it, please, um, or we can move on. But um, patients of those three types with people, with suffering, with the spiritual path. Um, I, uh, I remember from the retreat, a beautiful meditation we made on forgiveness. And, um, and, uh, uh, what, what happened to my mind now is the connection of uh, forgiveness and of patience with, uh, with emptiness because we, we are dealing with emptiness. So the moment, you, the moment you have 
a little glimpse on emptiness, it becomes easier to be in a state of patience and of forgiveness. Exactly. Yeah, and vice versa, isn't it? Both ways. And vice versa, of course. Yeah, it's, it's really true. Um, if, if you guys haven't seen this book before of His Holiness, I really recommend you get it. It's called The Wisdom of Forgiveness. And The Wisdom of Forgiveness by His Holiness is just, it's a, just a beautiful, beautiful book. Because, of course, forgiveness as a term isn't really talked about in Buddhism very much. It's kind of a conclusion you come to naturally as the result of other thoughts. You know, because of compassion, forgiveness. Because of love, forgiveness. Because of emptiness, forgiveness. Because of patience, forgiveness. But we don't kind of brand it that way as like, like a project to work on, which is kind of interesting. So I think that um, this book by His Holiness is really lovely because it's, it's not a term that we go into a lot of depth about, even though it's a concept we touch in many different ways. Um, you know, in uh, many other traditions, forgiveness is a huge topic and is talked about in a lot of depth and should be warranted. I've already mentioned it uh, previously when we uh, <coughs> talked about uh, this uh, perfection, and I want to stress again that the word fortitude that is going as a equivalent to patience means in Hebrew ometzlev, courage. And I want to say something about this uh, centrality of this. Uh, notion of courage in self-psychology and in the cultivation of ourself as self-object. Uh, patience uh, sometimes is less connot uh, connotative with uh, uh, sublime uh, characteristics and I think that courage uh, resonates it much more for us Westerners. Uh, what does it take to be patient? You have to be courageous enough uh, to renounce your uh, centrality in order to put the other in front of you, ahead of you. So the self-cherishing attitude is, uh, is abolished by this, uh, by this perfection of being courageous and patient. You know, you have to be bigger than your own emotional responses. And, you know, it plays into this idea of courage a little bit because the small mind, the reactive mind, the emotional mind wants to get its point across. It wants to make its hurt, woundedness felt and seen. It wants to retaliate. That's what the small egoistic mind wants to do. It wants to say, this is not what I wanted and everyone should know it. You know, the, the more mature mind, the more expansive, fortified mind, the courageous mind says, even if it's not what I wanted, even if I'm hurt by it, retaliation in no way supports the greater good. It doesn't satisfy me in the long term, even if immediately it is. And so it's kind of got this, you know, it, for lack of a better word, maturity that says short term satisfaction is not enough of a reason to retaliate because long-term benefit is more important to me or long-term connection, long-term relationship is more important to me. So, you know, these kinds of reactivity, they, they come from a mind that has gotten itself a little bit fragile, a little bit small. Um, and so we have to kind of, in a way, be bigger than our own emotional responses. And there's more space for them to do what they need to do to settle down. In, in His Holiness's commentary, he was saying how it's much easier to be patient with people who have power over you, because if you lose your patience, they have the power to hurt you or control you. It's a, it's a larger sign of your practice of patience if you're able to be patient with people who you have control over, yeah, who you, have, who you are in a dominant position with. Um, you know, I, I had a, a friend who was a little bit lower income who would always be very snappy at waitresses and waiters whenever we would go out to eat, you know, because they were, quote, lower than her. And she felt dissatisfied with her life. And so she would kind of take it out on waitresses and waiters and kind of be like, come on, come on, where's the bill? Where's the check? And she was really demanding and really, you know, this is her outlet for all of her rage, but she's not going to let the outlet of her rage is actually her boss. You know, her boss is the one who's oppressing her and is hard on her and is making life difficult. She can't 
do anything about that. And so then she takes it out on someone, quote, lower. And so our practice of patients kind of litmus test is, are we able to remain patient um, with those we consider lower, who we are having power over in some way. So I thought it was interesting His Holiness brought that into the commentary, just kind of a noticing how, how activated your patience is, if it can continue even when you kind of can get off the hook for it. And um, yeah, it, it's always quite interesting um, how people treat what children, small animals, and people of low income. You know, it's always a really good measure of how, how kind of integrated and patient people have become. Um, yeah, because they have no power over them. So it's not, you know, it's not doing anything for their ego necessarily. Maybe it is, but you know, interesting to look at. So then the joyous effort one was um, seeing even hearers and solitary realizers, these practitioners who are foundational vehicle, who accomplish only their own good, strive as if to put out a fire on their head, for the sake of all sentient beings, make enthusiastic effort, the source of all good qualities. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So it's saying that you know, people who actually understand cause and effect, who understand what the source of happiness and suffering are, and who are working for nirvana and their own liberation, work as if their head is on fire. You know, that's how much effort they put into their path. We, as people who want to be uh, Mahayanists, need to work even harder than that, have even more effort than that, because we're working for all sentient beings, not just ourselves. So it's kind of a little nudge to aspiring bodhisattvas like us to say, if we really understood cause and effect, um, we would be working really differently. Because these people who do understand cause and effect and are working just for their own liberation work as if their head is on fire. You know, so it's not, it's not like a, um, I don't know, beat yourself up for not working harder. It's more of a look at how much um, intensive focus practice would have if your head was on fire. You wouldn't be thinking, I'll wait and I'll put it out later. <laughs> you wouldn't be thinking, um, let's see if someone else can help me put it out. You would just immediately be very focused on water, what, something, let's put it out. Let's just put it out. That's the main focus of my life so much more so bodhisattvas putting out the fire of all sentient beings. So the way that we kind of generate this for ourselves is to think right now there are some sentient beings I can benefit and that is worth sitting with and rejoicing in. Do that <laughs> and then think there are so many sentient beings that I would benefit more and deeper if I had practiced my own path. Even just the ones I'm working with now, I would work with at a deeper level if I had worked on my own practice more. So it's just kind of like using the knowledge of their suffering to give you fortitude and joyous effort for your own practice. Rather than thinking you can just kind of get away with practicing at the level that you practice, because it does get good work done and it is useful and it is wonderful stuff then you can kind of like settle into some sort of complacency because it works well enough. You know, so we're just wanting to have the right amount of striving that has momentum, but not so much that it gets into panic and backlash and rebellion. So just, just that again, again, this idea of pacing is so important because when you push too hard and then you stop, you ruin your momentum. But if you never really do anything continuously, you don't ever gather the momentum that will make things get easier and easier. So it, it's so hard for our pride to say, I'm going to meditate five minutes every day, when we think we can meditate two hours every day because we did that one time. Yeah, that one time we meditated two hours real good. That one time five years ago, that was great. That's who I am as a practitioner. So that's what I hold myself up to every single day. When in fact, you, you know, that's too much pressure. And so you can't meditate two hours every day. So you don't meditate at all. Because you can't be perfect today, you're not going to even strive for perfection. This is what pride does to us. So to kind of look at joyous effort is fueled by continuity 
and by appropriate pacing means that you have to kind of step back from the identity that your pride gives you and say, that was me under a certain set of conditions. My more normal conditions support this level of practice. And this level of practice is profound if I do it. Five minutes every day is profound if you do it. Two hours once every five years has limited effect. And it kind of sets you up an unfortunate expectation of yourself that you're always disappointed in not living up to. So, so joyous effort is really about continuity. Not too tight, not too loose, etc. Yeah, Rana? Why it is given here in this uh, uh, verse the source of all good qualities? Why it is given a kind of a primacy? Because um, without energy, you don't do anything that you've learned. So it's like the things that you learn, like emptiness and bodhicitta are, are important, are like the most vital parts of practice, emptiness and bodhicitta and renunciation. But to actually do them, you need joyous effort. So it's kind of this like knowing is not enough. The doing, the energy for it is what actually enacts its integration. And that's why it's the source of all good qualities. But remember good qualities, um, this is my name, right? Yin Den, it's a form of wisdom. And it's a lower form of wisdom than Sheriff and Yeshe. It's like, the, it's like competency, like across the board competency, which is um, built from understanding, then doing, then understanding, then doing. So this type of good qualities, it's not like um, the, if it was Shereb or Yeshe, it would say the source of all knowledge and transcendental wisdom. Here it's saying it's the source of all like worldly wisdom and competencies. So that's what the word good qualities, yin den, means the source of all like competencies. Yeah. So hearers and solitary realizers, you know who these guys are. Strive. Yep. So this verse, I think it, it's pretty straightforward given that we did a whole kind of month on joyous effort. But if you're kind of reaching back to those introductory talks we did on joyous effort, did you have any kind of hanging doubts or hanging ideas. There were those kind of four types of joyous effort. Then there were the obstacles to energy, those types of laziness. And then there were the supports for it. Um, so if you're kind of reaching back to those, to that section in the joyous effort um, piece, did you have any hanging ideas? You can look at the outline if that helps. The um, Joy Separate Outline was on page 18. It was a little bit, um, uh, I don't know, thought. Uh, I, I didn't understand why, they, why the comparison uh, to others, uh, it seemed a little, I, I understood the content, yeah? But um, it seemed a little bit, competitive even. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's talking to the, I mean, the audience for this text is people who already identify as Mahianists. The audience isn't people who are ambiguous or not sure of which style of practice they're going to do. This is talking to people who are already identify as Mahianists. And it's basically, a, it is a little bit competitive in a way, but it's kind of saying you think that you're superior because you have a superior goal, but you don't even work as hard as these people with a quote lower goal. These people with a quote lower goal are actually working a lot harder than you and your so-called higher goal. So, you know, it's kind of like, oi. So it is, it is a little bit of that kind of um, healthy competition breeds excellence, silly kind of worldly thinking. But if it gets you to kind of shake off any pride of being a Mahianist or any laziness thinking because you're a Mahianist, your practice is naturally superior. Of course, Mahianists, our practice could be anywhere at all and often is quite less than people on the foundational vehicle. Often people of the foundational vehicle are practicing a lot uh, more, a lot more deeply, a lot more consistently and might achieve enlightenment far quicker than us but we identify as, oh, I'm the great vehicle, you know. So it, it is a little bit of that, like, poking, 
poking holes in our pride of being Mahayanas. Yeah, yeah, so if you like this um, teaching style or this um, call to practice style or not, um, that's something worth sitting with. I know I'm not particularly motivated by things framed that way. I'm kind of like, so you're telling me I'm crap is what you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could, I could take it that way. Or, um, wow, they are so amazing. I, I don't practice like my head is on fire. What does that mean? That means I don't have renunciation. You know, so take a step, a step back from the emotional response and say, ah, that means I don't have renunciation. If I had renunciation, I would practice like my head was on fire because I would understand that all of my negative habits are directly related to my future suffering. And that is completely blocking my ability to progress. You know, I'm, cre I'm leaving myself a legacy every single day of the same old thing. Do I want to have this same exact life every day forever? There's wonderful things about this life, but this mind isn't necessarily as under control as I would like it to be. If I really understood cause and effect, I would practice differently. So, so to kind of, I can step back from the, my initial reaction of, I don't really like things being framed in this way to what is it really saying? If I had renunciation, I would practice differently. And I like bodhicitta, bodhicitta resonates with me and that motivates me, but to really have bodhicitta motivate me, I need to combine it with renunciation because separated, they have less power. I need to be disillusioned with my own suffering and my own causes of suffering. Otherwise, I'm not going to have the same understanding of the suffering of others and the same will to kind of go forward into that. Okay, so if you turn to your Chandrakirti book, chapter three, page 28. The sevenfold reasoning is very similar to the fourfold analysis, which was your meditation. And you've done that meditation before, and it's a meditation that's really important to get familiar with, the fourfold analysis. So if you haven't done it yet today, please do try to do the fourfold analysis. Even if you just walk yourself through it using the main points, you don't have to listen to me doing it. Walk yourself through it. Um, the outline of it is in the chat if you need it. But um, the whole idea of the fourfold or the sevenfold analysis is analyzing the chariot. So I, anyway, I'm sure you guys all know what a chariot is, but in case you don't know the word in English, that's a chariot, can you see it? That's <laughs> a chariot, okay. So we're analyzing a chariot, this is a chariot. You don't have to have any Roman connotations. You can think Victorian chariots, okay. So we're analyzing a chariot because chariots are, um, you know, something that you can see the parts of quite easily. So you could analyze a car if you prefer. But the idea of analyzing the chariot is to, to really look at how, from a distance, you immediately say, sure, it's a chariot. In and of itself, it's a chariot. And then when you look for what exactly is the essential essence, it's very easy to do the find the non-finding and then apply that to the self. So you do it with something that's not emotionally confronting, that's not volatile, that you don't have a whole story about. It's just a car, right? Or it's just a chariot. And because you can get used to these really logical ways of thinking on the basis of that, transferring it to the self becomes a lot more straightforward. Okay, so at the bottom of the page, um, it says, Chandrakirti shows that if a yogi examines the basis of designation chariot, i.e. the wheels, axle, body, and so forth, that gives rise to the designation chariot he will be unable to find any chariot there. The only chariot that does exist is the imputed chariot itself. Okay, so that which is merely labeled on the collection of parts. So, so far, this is stuff that you know. So in brief, the seven aspects of the sevenfold analysis, there is no chariot which is other than its parts. There is no chariot which is the same as its parts. There is no chariot which inherently possesses its parts. There is no chariot which inherently depends upon its parts. There is no chariot upon which its parts are inherently dependent. There is no chariot which is the mere collection of its parts. 
There is no chariot, which is the shape of its parts. So those are the ways in which our mind falls into accepting the idea of inheritance. It either, you know, it frames things in one of those ways. It says it is exactly as it seems to be. The way my ignorance frames it is true because, and it goes into one of those justifications, whether in words or just kind of in instinct, that's the way we think of things. The, um, the main section is actually on page 32. So if you go to page 32, it kind of unpacks this a little bit. You see where the numbering begins at halfway down the page. So just above the numbering, the sevenfold reasoning has nine essentials or stages in its practice. The first two must be done before the others, but the remaining seven may be done in any order that seem appropriate. Okay, so it's basically saying you always need to do number one first, number two second. All the rest of them you can do in any order. You can do what resonates with you and skip the others. But basically when you're feeling particularly triggered, ask yourself one of these questions. So you start with the essential of ascertaining the object to be negated, which is what we talked about last week. You know, so you have to sit with what seems to be true. Even though I know it's not, what seems to be true, I'm not gonna confront it right away. You have to hold it in front of you and really see the seeming inherence. Then the second part is the essential of ascertaining the pervasion. So the pervasion, not perversion, right? Pervasion means pervading, what pervades, right? This, this word pervading. So what reasoning pervades? The, so basically it's saying that as is said in the fourfold analysis, things either need to be one with their aggregates or separate from their aggregates. Those are the only two ways things exist, if they were to inherently exist. Does that make sense? If they did inherently exist, it would be one of, in one of two ways. So you're not, you're not confronting your appearance of inherence yet. You have to say, if it's as, as it seems, then the essential core, the root, the soul, the whatever you want to call it, the spirit, the identity is either one with or the same or separate from and different. Yeah. So it's, it's this idea of throwing an absurd consequence to help you come to wisdom, which can sound really technical and really cognitive, except when you're looking at someone who's stuck in their story, can you talk them out of their story? Or does it help to keep asking them questions to elaborate on their story until it comes to an absurd conclusion and they drop the story by themselves? It's a, it's a really um, interesting way of helping someone let go of a fallacy. You know, it's a really good way of helping someone look, you know, let go of a flawed logic is to, instead of confronting the flaw, to say, okay, let's assume what you're saying is true. So if that's true, then this or this, let's just go down each rabbit hole and see where it leads. It's a really useful technique and you can kind of take the emotion out of things. And because what you're doing is throwing what's called an absurd consequence, the end result of letting go of the story is often laughter, like the laughter of self-awareness. You know, seeing the absurdity of your own story can make you shake it off without any kind of, um, I don't know, fragileness, defensiveness. I need to, um, I don't know, save my pride. You can just let go of the story and laugh yourself out of it. So one with or same um, is elaborated and separate from is elaborated in these other points. So that's what those other points are doing. It's versions of those two themes. Okay, so number three is the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed is not the same as its basis of imputation. So this is a really normal trap to fall into, isn't it? You, you look at the basis and you think that is it. Yeah, you're like, yeah, do you know what I mean? So you see the parts of the chariot and you think, sure, that's, that's it. Yeah, the basis is it. And then you say, where? Is it the wheel? Is it the axle? Is it the hub? None of that is the chariot, yeah? And then the fourth point, the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed 
is not different than its basis of imputation. You say, okay, okay, it's not its parts. Okay, I get that, that's the basis. But then there's a chariot there, this, you know, besides the parts, there's the chariot, right? Yeah? And so you're sort of like, all right, so there's some separate entity that's the container. That's the way it can start to feel, just like the self, right? It can kind of feel like there's something holding or containing the parts, like a bag, you know? Or like, um, I don't know, you are the web and the self is the spider, you know? That it can feel like maybe you're the puppet and the self is the puppeteer. It can feel like that. And with each of these points, you can kind of allow yourself to feel, feel into the fallacy when you might think that is in fact the case. Yeah, so you can do it with a chariot because it's less confronting, but you can jump straight to the self if you want to. And then you have the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed is not dependent on the basis of imputation, which is a very confusing point because of course it is dependent on the basis of imp imputation. It's just not inherently dependent. That's the key word. So to say all phenomena are dependent on their basis of imputation, that's fine. But to think that that's inherently the case, that's the trap. Yeah, that those parts create that label. Yeah, that's what we can start to think. The parts made that label and those are the parts that make that label and the only things that can make that label and only those parts. And so you could do something like, at what point does the chariot stop being a chariot? If I take off the doors, is it still a chariot? You say, sure, sure. If I take off the wheels, is it still a chariot? Sure, if I knew it had wheels at one point, now when the wheels are gone, I can still impute chariot, no problem. How much do you have to take off before the chariot is gone? You know, so if those parts made that label, then they could only make that label and only those parts could make it. But set taking away some of the parts, you can still have the label. You with me? Ish. This is just an introduction, right? So don't worry if bits of it are vague. Um, the number six is the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed is not the support upon which its basis of imputation are dependent. The phenomena imputed or labeled is not the support. Yeah, so it's similar, right? The essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed does not possess the basis of imputation. This is a very common one, right? To think that there's a possessor of the parts, that there's a possessor of the causes and conditions, there's a possessor of the basis. Then you would be able to find it. Yeah. Um, so then number eight is the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed is not the mere collection of the basis of imputation. So this is getting more subtle because we often think it is, it's the mere collection. And we think that that's going in the right way. When in fact, it's not the mere collection, there's the mere collection, and then there is the labeling on the mere collection, dependently labeling on the mere collection, and it is so subtle, it's as if it's not there, but there's still, it's not going into nihilism. It's just so close though. Okay, and then nine, the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed is not the shape of its basis of imputation. So this is a less common trap to fall into. Um, a less, you know, to think that like the outline of the chariot is the chariot. So you think, okay, none of the parts are in and of itself the chariot, but the, the outline of it, the shape of it somehow is. And in our daily life, the shape of a person uh, sometimes is the first thing that appears to our mind and then we have all of our projections and whatnot. So with each of these, you just start sitting with, if that were the case, let's follow it down the rabbit hole. If things were the same as their aggregates, then the self would be like riding on top of each aggregate.
Yeah, so there would be I intention, I discrimination, I feeling, and the fallacy of that would be you would have multiple selves. And the interaction between feeling and discrimination, for example, couldn't be the way that it actually is, which is that they're dependent on each other. What you label has an influence on what you feel. What you feel has an influence on what you label. If the I were on each one of those, they would be this like, you know, independent entities that could choose to collaborate or not. They could have interactions or not. And that becomes absurd. You with me? And so then if they're different, then there's a separate aggregate, like a sixth ag aggregate or a boss aggregate um, that's somehow saying, go this way, go that way, when anything that seems that is just another mental factor most of the time. So it's, it's a bit like if you were in an airplane going over a herd of horses, and the herd of horses, you know, is going this way and going that way, and you decided that one in the center was the main one deciding everything, rather than it being a kind of interdependent flow of mutual kind of herd decision making. You know, all of them interacting off of each other, interacting off of their environment, interacting off of any number of things, and there's not like a boss one in the middle, even though, of course, in a herd, there is like the boss mirror. But, you know, there's not like the one who has just all of the power and can say to the herd, everyone stop. Do you know what I mean? Or like a school of fish or a flock of birds. So the aggregates are a bit like a school of fish or a flock of birds or a herd of horses in that there's a shape you can say that is the flock. That is the herd. And there's a shape there and there's movement there and there's experience there, but no one piece is primary. And of course, it's even more subtle than that because each of those individuals then have their parts, which have their parts, which have their parts, right? So the sevenfold analysis is really useful. Um, I'm gonna make you a meditation for it for next Wednesday, but um, right now we're gonna to shift um, to the Heart Sutra starting next week, because the Heart Sutra is maybe more um, connected to the Bodhicitta path. But um, yeah, if you're us, yeah. Won't we return back to chapter two? Of the object of negation? Of the, 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 seven, the, same, the same book. Um, that was just going over the, the object of negation, which we talked about a lot last week. Um, but if you have specific questions about it, we can go over it next week if you have, you know, explain this line or that line. Or you can email me. Okay. Yeah. Or, I mean, we can spend more time on this text if, if you're really intrigued and we can wait on the Heart Sutra until the last week. You know, send me some feedback. It's, um, you know, let me know what's working for you and what's not working for you. So if you'd rather spend more time on sevenfold analysis, we can. Um, just let me know where you're at. Okay, so um, we'll just take a minute and reconnect. Coming back to the breath. Thanks guys. So um, read, read slowly. Just read really, really slowly. Yeah. <laughs> again, again. Yeah. And that page 32, those steps just kind of sit with each one. And then if you want to elaborate, there's, you know, a few paragraphs on each one. Um, but you just see how you go. And you can always send me email questions.
Bye.